So it's a great pleasure for me to be able to tell you about new results from a new X-ray telescope. And the outline of my talk is relatively straightforward. I will start with some basics about the mission, uh, technical characteristic and mission profiles, the status of the operations, and then spend most of my talk with uh, going through a few early results and highlights of <clears throat> about two years now, it's, by, it's been about two years of science operations. So, but I will start with the motivational slide. Uh, probably it's a simplification, but you know, it's that kind of simplification that you need to put forward to funding agencies when you wanna build a large project. And in this particular, you know, I'll try to answer why did we build the Rosita? What, what did we build it for? But hopefully in the rest of my talk, I will show you that in fact, we have a, a quite diverse range of scientific uh, objectives, but the main one originally well, had to do with cosmology and in particular clusters cosmology. Uh, a simple way to illustrate the point is by taking this picture on the left, which is coming from relatively old uh, N-body simulation of dark matter in the universe. This represents slices through the dark matter distribution, a different redshift. Each column is a different epoch, redshift three, one, and zero from left to right. And each row, it's a different uh, um, combination of cosmological parameter. Um, and it's not really that relevant to what is what. The main point here is that um, if you adjust your um, cosmology to reproduce some basic statistics of the dark matter distribution of zero, then you see how different they look uh, at uh, different redshifts. And if you wanna go beyond this very qualitative statement, uh, for example, you can look at the zero order statistics, essentially the number density of the knots in the filamentary structure of the universe. This is what this plot on the bottom right shows. This is the number density of dark matter halos, so these are the collapsed uh, knots uh, in between filaments. This is uh, now normalized to their number at redshift zero. So this is the number of halo above a given mass. The mass is written here, five times 10 to the 14 solar masses. And uh, everything is normalized at redshift zero. And these different curves, different colored curves represent uh, the expected number density evolution with redshift for different cosmological uh, models, if you want, or combination in particular, omega lambda and omega matter. And notice here the, the, the scale is logarithmic on the y-axis, okay? So this is a quantitative way of saying that counting clusters has quite some power in constraining the growth of structure in the universe and therefore constraining dark energy and dark matter. Now, why do we want to build an X-ray telescope to count clusters? Well, the point is that these uh, uh, clusters are so massive that their virial temperatures are in the millions of degrees. And so any baryonic matter which is trapped into this collapsed structure, if uh, uh, is expected to virialize by model of large-scale structure formation and therefore reach temperatures which are conducive to bright X-ray emission. So at those temperature, free free emission, Bremsstrahlung emission will, will shine bright in X-rays. So if you want, in a nutshell, the requirement for Erosita was to build the telescope, which was sensitive enough to detect clusters in large numbers up to at least redshift 0.8 or one in order to leverage on this strong cosmological evolution. And so this essentially, and we set up a number goal of 100,000 clusters by doing some very basic statistical consideration of the uh, uh, statistical error you, we wanted to reduce. And the second point was to build a telescope that would allow us to recognize clusters as such in our images, because these clusters are of course extended in the sky they subtend typical arc minute scales, and thanks to the evolution of uh, diameter, angular diameter size, um, um, if you're able to resolve below one arc minute, then you can safely assume that you will, be able, you will resolve those objects throughout the history of the universe. Okay, so this effectively fix the size of the telescope and its optical quality, if you want, in a nutshell. 
Uh, of course, the history is longer and more complicated than that, but in, uh, th that was the proposal that was made to the German space agency in 2007. And eventually over two years, uh, funding for the telescope was obtained from the German space agency as the Max Planck Society. And then a bilateral agreement was signed between Germany and Russia to put Erosita onto a, a mission called Spectrum Röntgen Gamma. This, for those of you who have some memory about the history of X-ray astronomy, is essentially the same name. There, there used to be a Spectrum X Gamma in the books of the old uh, Soviet Union in the late 80s, but that mission, which was a large US, uh, USSR-led uh, international mission, did not survive the funding crisis of the Russia space, space science after the collapse of the Soviet Union and was revived in the 2000s after the discovery of dark energy or the accelerated expansion of the universe. Um, so uh, we proceed into the building phase from 2009. The spacecraft was designed in Russia by Lavochkin Association. Uh, and uh, as I will show you in a minute, Two payloads uh, have been produced, uh, both operating in X-ray wavelength range, a Russian-led uh, hard X-ray telescope called Mikhail Pavlinsky Artex C, designed and built at IKI, which is the uh, Space Institute of the Russian Academy of Science, with support from NASA Marshall, and uh, Irozita that was built in Germany by a consortium led by MP, my institute. And these are a few key names of people that had the managerial roles in the, into the mission Rashid Sunyaev, who is the lead scientist in Russia. Peter Predelli was the PI of Irosita throughout his development, building, and, and early phases. And I took his place only last year. And Paul Nandra, the director of the high energy group at MP, who shared with them most of the high level managing. And uh, here I want to mention in particular, I mean, of course, the German consortium was constituted by a group of a small group of university under the leadership of MP. At MP, we did most of the project management, but also most of the instrument design, manufacturing, integration and test. And now we are doing data handling, processing and archive. So even for a large institute like ours, managing uh, let's say two thirds or three quarter of a space uh, mission of the size of Irosita is quite a challenge. Okay, that's a picture of the hardware. This is taken in Baikonur a few days before launch. Um, what you see here on the right are the two telescopes. These are two separate ones, but they point in the same direction in the sky. Irosita is the largest one, and this will be the focus of my talk. Artex C here has you know, longer focal length because it, it's used to focus hard X-ray photons, higher, higher energy X-ray photons, but it's much smaller uh, as aperture, so much less sensitive. And um, here the both instruments are mounted onto the navigator platform. Here you see the folded solar panels and the platform provide power to the telescope and also the means of transmitting the data back to Earth. Um, looking inside the Rosita now, these were pictures taken at MPE during the construction phase, uh, maybe four or five years ago. Here you actually see what really, how the Rosita X-ray telescope work. In fact, we are not talking about one telescope, but an array of seven identical telescopes. And they work like all focusing X-ray telescope uh, using the Volter one uh, focusing principle, essentially, uh, X-rays uh, scatter at low angles with uh, lightweight gold-coated uh, tubes, if you want, which have the special geometry so that they can focus the lights after two reflection into the focal plane. Um, Optics-wise, we have essentially inherited XMM-Newton technology. This is not the best possible spatial resolution. We have about 15 arc second alpha energy width or 18 arc second alpha energy width on axis. But the PSF, this is an image of the mapping of the PSF, uh, the point spread function. So the response to a point source, you see how badly it degrades as you move away from the optical axis. This is an inevitable characteristic of the optics as they are built. But for a reason that we will become clear later, what matters, the quality factor that matters is the average of the PSF over the field of view, which give you alpha energy width of about 30 arc second, 
If you are more familiar with full lead of maximum, this would correspond to about 15 arc second, given the shape of our PSF. That this, this allowed to position sources in the sky to about 4.5 arc second. So it's not the best, but it's probably it's in most cases good enough to identify our sources. Uh, and uh, here on the right, let me just move to uh, uh, the detector plane, seven telescopes, seven detectors. So the detectors are CCD. Uh, the technology is called PN CCD. This is the same of the PN cameras of an XMM Newton, the most powerful camera on the XMM Newton telescope with some improvements. Uh, we build a frame store so that we can collect events while we read out. So there are no so-called out of time events. The cameras are fully exposed to X-ray light, so there are no chip gaps. This uh, helps in getting uh, high quality image throughout. And the detector are very uniform um, with very little, little temperature dependence. We have about 1 million pixel, quite big. Each one is about nine arc second in size, 1, billion, 1 million pixel over the seven cameras. But the quality of the detectors can also be judged by our ability to measure energies, because if you're not familiar with that X-ray imaging is uh, at the same time uh, contains spectral information. We do essentially integral field unit spectroscopy every time we expose our CCD detector, of course, with relatively low resolution, but we can measure the energy of each single photon. And the energy resolution of our cameras is about 20. So, we 80 electron volt at 1.5 kilo electron volt, which is almost a factor of two better than XMM. Okay, this is maybe one single plot you want to take home about the capability of Irozita as a telescope. So it's the effective area average over the field of view. Essentially, how big a bucket a photon collecting bucket Irozita is. And here is a comparison of Irozita 7 combined telescope in red with XMM Newton, the three telescope combined in blue. So in this energy range between 0.3 kilo electron volt and 2.3 kilo electron volt, uh, Erosita XM and XMM Newton are essentially uh, comparable. In fact, that one kilo electron volt Erosita is slightly larger than XMM Newton and definitely much more, la much larger than Rosat or Chandra. The other factor, which is important for the science you want to do, and especially for surveying the sky, is the field of view. So with the small focal length of Irosita, much more compact than SMM Newton, we have much larger field of view. It's a faster telescope, if you want. Here is a comparison of the XMM Newton Chandra field of view compared with Irosita, which, which is about uh, one degree in size. You, we have also developed, together with uh, the, our Russian colleagues, a new, well, at least for X-ray astronomy, a new method of observing live, live, large regions of the sky, so-called raster scan. So if you want to cover many tens of square degrees, it's much more efficient to keep the telescope moving back and forth rather than pointing at there. It will also give you much more uniformly exposed images over large areas. And this is one preview example of a beautiful X-ray image of a system of interacting cluster, but I will get back to that image later on. But uh, these kind of wide field X-ray images were not possible with current instruments, with similarly sensitive instruments. Okay, uh, quickly about the uh, uh, mission profile and programmatics, we launched from Baikonur in July 2019 with a big Proton rocket. And the Proton had delivered perfectly the spacecraft into this large halo orbit around the L2, the second Lagrange point of the Sun-Earth system. This is the first X-ray telescope that operates at L2. It's a similar orbit shape as um, Herschel had, for example. It's a preferred location for you know, uninterrupted uh, survey operations like Hirozita is doing. One slide about status of the instrument. Essentially, all subsystems are working. We are, we are now working essentially within spec. Uh, you see mostly is green in terms of uh, uh, thermal control of the mirror and the cameras. Uh, we have largely larger operating temperature. We operate the cameras at minus 85 instead of minus 90, as we were hoping for due to some small problem into the passive cooling system of one of the two big radiators. And the cameras themselves work fine. 
um, we have some issue with electronics that get um, uh, some heats from cosmic rays that uh, send them into uh, essentially necessity of being resetted. And this happens quite frequently, maybe once per week. In total, we lose about three, four percent of uh, observing time by having to do this camera reset every once in a while. We have had already three micrometeorites impacts on three of our uh, telescope modules, two pretty marginal with only a few pixel uh, damage, but in one case, we lost almost 4,000 pixels. This was a very big event. And then we had some issue with uh, light leak affecting two of our seven cameras. This is not a problem. It's essentially sunlight reflection due to a, a design fault, probably, um, uh, which is filtered out if you only are interested in the X-ray range. But illuminating the surface of the camera changed the energy response. So with these two cameras, it's a bit more difficult to do accurate spectroscopy. One interesting point is, because we are the first X-ray telescope at L2, what the background look like. This is a uh, rate of the medium ionizing particle rejected on board uh, in, the, in Irosita, uh, in one of the cameras. And there is a broad uh, plateau that corresponds to the period of the solar minimum. And this was well known that the rate of cosmic rays at L2 anticorrelate with solar activity. But, uh, and plus there is some residual modulation on, on the solar rotation period also seen by Gaia. I mean, I'm not an expert, so I, I, I don't know whether this, how surprising that is, but what the good news for, for us is that if you look at the y-axis, the background fluctuates at very small percent level. It's relatively stable, apart from some secular evolution. You, that the background is very stable. You can see also in this plot. On the right, I'm showing the light curve of the background measured simultaneously by Rosita and XMM Newton pointing at the same object in the sky in three energy range, soft, medium, and hard. And the Rosita background is the red light curve and the XMM Newton background is the blue and green. And so you see that the Rosita background uh, uh, is much more stable than the XMM Newton one, which is good news. Here you see actually a spectrum of the background integrated over about six months of observation. Uh, our combined spectrum is the blue, which is a combination of the cosmic background uh, in black. This comes from uh, hot gas within the Milky Way and uh, distant uh, supermassive black hole. So it's a combination of distant uh, background and foreground, if you want. And the red, this is particle background. This is essentially the background that comes from interaction of particles with our instrument. And this is about factor of three higher than we thought we were, we were going to see in pre-flight estimate, um, partly due to the fact that we have been operating, um, um, well, I think it's partly due to a, a non-perfect modeling of our instrument itself, and part uh, due to the fact that by operating at solar minimum, we were at the maximum at the particle rate. Uh, but so mixed news, but in, I would say in general more positive than negative because the background is so stable that you, once you know the shape and the spectrum of it, uh, you can quite robustly remove it. Okay, one last slide about programmatics. Uh, we, I said launch was in July 2019. We spent about three months in, uh, towards the end of 2019 doing calibration and performance verification observation. These, the, the data correspond to this observation have been released to the public early this year in July, together with a series of papers, the scientific papers describing the main results. And I will, of course, now go into some of these highlights. At the end of December, mid-December 2019, we start an old sky survey program uh, in which every six months, I will show you now an anime, later an animation, in which every six months we cover the old sky. So ERAS one, two, three, four, five, until eight is our plan to cover the sky eight times over four years. So we are now towards the end of the fourth of the planned eight all sky surveys. We haven't released yet to the world any of these all sky survey data. The first data release of the first all sky survey will happen next year. And then we will have two releases that will contain all the data accumulated until mid 2021 and then until the end of the all sky survey proper phase. 
Okay, now I, I want to jump to the highlights, We're showing some nice pictures, but maybe I can pause for a second and ask whether there are any questions for anything I've said until now. I don't see any raised hands. So okay. You can continue. Okay. Okay, so let me start with some highlights from our CalPV phase. This is actually a picture taken in our control room at MPE while we were exposing our first light images. These are the image, the, as the photo accumulates into the detector, we were monitoring this, the seven image from the seven cameras. It was a very exciting moment, as you can imagine. And this is now the picture taken by combining these seven cameras together, the seven telescopes together. What we are looking at now, is a region around the Large Magellanic Cloud centered on the famous supernova 1987A. This bright source is actually a point source that looks a bit extended because it fills the wing of the PSF. It's very bright. Uh, but everything else you see around, uh, the color represent uh, photons of different energy. So red is lower energy between, I think, half a kV and one kV. Green is between one and two kilo electron volt and blue is about two kilo electron volt. So the color gives you an idea of how energetics the photons are, and the structure that you see are structures imprinted in the ISM of the Magellanic Cloud by supernovae, typical are supernova bubbles or, or big bubbles blown by uh, massive star winds. Of course, you see a lot of point sources. These are either foreground or background. Uh, so there is a very variety of structure that you see in your image. By comparison here is the first light of XMM Newton in the same part of the sky. It's slightly sharper, if you notice, but the as much smaller field of view uh, means that you lose uh, the, uh, your ability to, the, to study uh, on larger scale the ISM of the Magellanic Cloud. So I'm going to now go quickly through some beautiful pictures that we took. Uh, this again on the left is uh, an X-ray image of a bright, one of the brightest X-ray supernova remnant, uh, Sukupis A. Again, color coded by the energies of the photons in a similar vein as I told you before. Um, and so here you see with the Rosita we can cover essentially in in, in one go about uh, uh, three or four square degree image, which of course is much more difficult to do with Chandra X Newton, revealing a lot of details. Uh, about the supernova remnant. And there is a paper out by Michael, a student uh, in our group that used the X-ray spectra of different region to study how different metals and, and different uh, ejected different temperature are um, expanding. Here on the right, you see again, the first light image around the Magell large Magellanic cloud complemented by a few other pointings combined together. And there are a number of papers that have studied the, the uh, not only the uh, ISM of the Magellanic Cloud, but also the amount of extinction between us and the cloud, which is useful information. And I mentioned the ability of taking spectra while taking images. So I'm now going back to the supernova 1987A. Uh, we can extract the spectrum from this uh, from the central source. And here you see a comparison of the Rosita spectrum in cyan with the XMM Newton PN first light spectrum in white. And apart from the high signal to noise of our observations, uh, you see how sharper the emission lines of different elements are in Rosita. So we can do better um, physics of these expanding supernova remnants. And there is a paper by Chandra Imaitra about that, if you are interested. Uh, let me move now to extra galactic beautiful images. So I think this is what in a sense Rosita has been designed for clusters of galaxies. These are now two deep pointings of two clusters of galaxies with both of them with interesting substructure. On the left is emerging system, Abel 3266. Here you see a false color image again taken by Rosita. This is quite deep, right? It's one day full exposure. Uh, and here you zoom in the central part and you take a spectrum for small beans, given the, the, the large number of photons we get, we can measure temperature and density and estimate the entropy of the gas, which is disturbed. And the entropy reveals much ni nicely the uh, steering of the intercluster medium by this uh, uh, merging process. 
And on the right, you see the famous coma cluster is now taken in this raster scan observation mode. So it's a very wide field, five degree on the side here. This is the Rosita image published in a paper by Churaso et al. If you subtract the smooth profile, then you notice a few more interesting structures in the X-ray emission. A shock, uh, two shocks actually, primary and secondary, which are related to the passage of groups, uh, smaller group NGC4839, probably in this orbit through the core of the coma cluster. So we can uh, work back uh, the dynamics of the mergers of this very famous in bright cluster. And now I go back to this image I showed you before of this triple interacting system of clusters of galaxies. This, of course, is not the Erosita image, it's the Rosa Tall Sky Survey, the image, the, the precursor of Erosita in the early 90s. Um, these are uh, sharp XMM Newton pointings, uh, three of them, one covering the northern cluster, one covering the southern system, and one in the middle. But uh, as you can imagine that with Erosita in this raster scan mode, we can cover about 10 square degree uh, quite deeply. And that's the image I was showing you before, uh, taken by Erosita in the 0.2 to 2 to the electron volt range. So our most sensitive band, where you clearly see a plethora of background, AG, mostly background AGN. These are all the point sources that you see, some foreground stars, and a large number, uh, interestingly enough, of diffused um, nebulosities. These are indeed extended X-ray sources uh, signaling clusters and groups of galaxies. So that's actually the same Im image with some wavelet filtering applied. All these red circles, uh, sources are um, groups and clumps, if you want, groups that are at the same redshift of this uh, three cluster merging system. So if you want in just one image, we are getting a view of this filamentary large scale structure coming together. Uh, that's a, a nice paper by Biffy et al. in which they made a comparison within a hydrodynamical simulation of merging clusters, picking up system that look the most like the one we observed. The one on the right is the real Erosita observation, yet another color scheme. But here you see that, um, you know, these are um, R200, roughly speaking, correspond to the virial radius of a cluster of this size. So both in the simulation, of course, but also in the real image, we can cover uh, up to three times, a region up to three times the virial radius of the clusters. And if you look at the colors, uh, the greenish uh, uh, suggests that we are actually detecting uh, with our soft X-ray sensitivity, diffuse emission into a 10, 15 megaparsec long filament that connects the merging clusters plus this Northern clump and a few other subsystem um, directly in our images. So it's quite interesting promise of studying much more detailed the process of formation of large structures with these kind of images. And then the largest uh, investment of time in our performance verification phase was to take a, a large 140 square degree uh, equatorial extragalactic field that had nothing particular in it, apart from being already observed by many optical and near infrared telescopes. So very good multi-wavelength information available. But the idea was to go as deep as we expect Erosita to go at the end of the eight uh, old sky survey program. So it's basically a preview of what the X-ray sky will look like once we have completed our old sky survey. And we have used this field to test our workflow so how we can detect objects, uh, the, uh, separate clusters from point-like sources, identify them and, and actually do science with them. So there is a large number of papers that we have put out to describe the process of going through observation to si survey science. I will show you a couple of uh, highlights. Again, this is the same field in X-ray in the 0.2 to 2.3 kV after having subtracted the point sources. So everything you see here are clusters and uh, some diffuse emission in between them, which is partly foreground and but partly tracing large scale structure. Uh, because of this good multi-wavelength uh, uh, information in that field, we can measure the redshift of this cluster, either spectroscopically or photometrically, so we can place them in 3D. And of course, also look at 
concentration of clusters that's called super clusters here is one ret relatively high redshift super cluster from very late in the history of, of the large scale structure but this is now a nice animation that essentially give you the third dimension where these big structures uh, how do they trace the filamentary large scale structure um, uh, for those more, more into uh, x-ray surveys of course most of what you see in this field is are point sources clusters represent just a few percent of the sources we detect most of them are point sources and using, for example, optical infra infrared color of the counterparts of our X-ray sources, we can very well separate stars, X-ray emitting stars, red in this plot, from uh, extragalactic sources, sources, which are by very large amount uh, um, supermassive black holes. So as far as stars are concerned, most of them are uh, coronally active main sequence stars. So using Gaia, we can identify them pretty easily. And here is a plot of X-ray detected main sequence stars in this field. Uh, it's the essentially Erzsprung Russell diagram of the X-ray emitting stars. The X-ray emission is important because of course it trace a strong magnetic field in the corona, high rotation. Uh, so it's an interesting subpopulation uh, of your stellar population in general. And then when you look at the blue, the AGN, we can again take advantage of the existing optical spectroscopic and photometric redshift information. So here it shows that we can detect uh, supermassive black hole up to redshift four uh, or even higher. We have even a couple of redshift six quasar in this field that we discovered. So it's a bro it allows, it will allow in the future quite a broad investigation of the evolution of supermassive black holes. Okay. And now in the remaining maybe 15, 20, 15, 20 minutes, I will go through the highlights from the Old Sky Survey program that has started in December 2019. This is an animation. I hope you can see it well. This shows how now the telescope operates. It's yet another point mode. We don't point, we don't do Russell scan, we just let the, the spacecraft rotate continuously. Um, and it rotates quite slowly. It takes about uh, four hours to do a great circle. And these great circles intersect uh, one another um, so that uh, following the motion of the L2 point around the sun behind the earth, um, we cover about one degree per day. And so in the 180 days, we have covered the entire sky. Here on the right, you see and now an animation of the real data accumulating at the ecliptic poles. So at the ecliptic poles, all these great circles intersect. And you, I hope you have seen how within six months, you close the sphere essentially with, oops, with data. And the plan is to do that for four years, uh, resulting in eight independent picture of the old sky. Uh, there are some numbers coming from the first old sky survey that we completed in June, 2020. The exposure in so doing, because of course the spacecraft also always rotate at the same rate. So apart from the region very close to the ecliptic poles where you, in, where you go over many, many times, the rest of the sky is quite uniformly exposed. It's shallow, only 200 seconds, uh, but we have a large telescope. So the sensitivity that we reach in, in 200 seconds of exposure is quite uh, deep. Uh, we, we go down to about five, 10, 10 to the minus 13 Earths per second per square centimeter in our most sensitive energy range. Uh, as I told you, the background is very stable. We also have quite flexible mission planning uh, so that we can always cover gaps in exposure, for example, that are due to the period where we have to switch on our instrument for the spacecraft to do orbit correction maneuvers. Um, so as I will show you in a minute, we can cover the entire celestial sphere without gaps. The entire volume of uh, useful data is about 400 million calibrated photons or just 80 gigabytes. So it's for optical survey telescope is not very much, but of course we have to transmit those data from L2. So we have to really minimize the telemetry. Uh, we have done some preliminary analysis of the, our X-ray images running source detection algorithm that we have developed. And so we know there are about 1 million sources detected in this one all sky survey. Uh, about 80% of those are distant galactic nuclei and 20% of those are stars and just maybe one or 2% are clusters. Um, one million is an interesting milestone because it double 
the number of known X-ray sources. In 50 years or 60 years of history of X-ray astronomers, before Rosita was launched, we knew about 1 million X-ray sources from collecting catalogs from many missions. And so in six months, we have doubled the number and we'll keep doubling it uh, more or less every six months. Now, this is a beautiful image of the old sky in galactic uh, project, in eight of projection, galactic coordinates or so the galactic center is at the center of this image. The, the Milky Way is horizontally placed. And here you're looking only at photons between one and 2.3 kilo electron volt. The reason why I chose this energy range is because it will become apparent in a second, but above about one keV, the ISM of the Milky Way is not hot enough to emit. So what you see is a relatively uniform uh, distribution of light that uh, is dominated by this world cosmic X-ray background. So the structure much more distant than our local group. Of course, you still see bright sources in the Milky Way. The, this very bright one is Scorpius X1, is a very, the brightest X-ray source, uh, it's a neutron star. Um, interestingly enough, if I overplot on the same scale, uh, galaxies within, let's say, 88 megaparsec. This is from the Tumas Redshift Galaxy. So it's a classical way of looking at large scale structure in the immediate, immediate neighborhood of our uh, local group. Then, uh, if you look closely, I'll go back and forth between the Irazita map and the optical map. You do trace this large scale structure also with our X ray detected clusters. And in fact, you can do more than just looking within uh, 88 megaparsec. You can take the entire two mass redshift surveys color coded by their uh, redshift. So there are some number of famous superstructure are, are uh, marked here with these arrows. Uh, you know, the Virgo cluster, the Chape supercluster, the Great Attractor, uh, and a few more. Uh, if I now substitute again the uh, galaxy map with the Rosita, uh, the arrow would point directly to superclusters or big clusters of galaxies. So with your X-ray eyes, you almost directly see the large scale structure around you. Okay, again, that's the hard, so the higher energy image. If I go at the opposite end of our spectral sensitivity, now be taking an image between 0.3 and 0.6 kilo electron volt, the situation is different. You see there is much more diffuse stuff that comes from the Milky Way. In fact, we think that a lot of this emission in this energy range uh, is local, quite local. It's a local bubble to us. Um, of course, there is some which is uh, obscured by dust. You see very strong effect of dust and gas in these dark shadows because the soft X-rays cannot penetrate through dust. So you see the imprint of dust structure. So not all of it can be local because otherwise you wouldn't see black here. But then even more interesting, if I go into intermediate energy range between 0.6 and one kilo electron volt, this is interesting because at those energy range, gas of about a few million degrees would emit most of its bremsstrahlung. And a million degrees is the expected halo temperature of the Milky Way CGM. And so here we are probably have the most direct view of the large halo of the Milky Way. And, and uh, by looking at these images where we discover that uh, symmetric to this north, northern arc-like feature that was known since the Rosa time called the North Polar Spur, there was a southern bubble-like feature. You see now my cursor pointing at, at it uh, that together represent a clear figure of eight. And uh, immediately we, we were reminiscent of the Fermi bubbles. So for those of you who don't know, these are uh, gamma ray uh, structures centered on the uh, Sagittarius A star, the center of the Milky Way. Uh, here you see clearly in a hardness ratio Fermi image in which you plot the ratio of the photons above three giga electron volt over the photons below three giga electron volt, you clearly see this bubble-like structure centered uh, on the Milky Way. And, and these were discovered in the early 2000s, early uh, 10s, sorry. And many, many papers have been written in trying to explain the origin of these bubbles. Uh, definitely some energy injection at the center is needed. Here you see a nice composition of the Fermi uh, uh, um, photons in red above, I think, one GAV uh, with the Fermi bubbles and this medium energy range from Irazita in the 0.6 to 1 kV. 
with these larger bubbles that seems to wrap around the Fermi bubbles. Here you see again back an Eosita image in the intermediate energy range, source point source subtracted uh, and slightly smoothed, so to much more clearly emphasize these two bubble-like structures. So we published that immediately as soon as we found them out in a nature paper last year it was one of probably the first major discovery from Irosita, uh, where we put up a simple toy model while we are still working on the actual analysis of the X-ray emission, its particular temperature composition of the gas at different position, but simply from the sharpness of the feature and some very basic consideration using a solar wind light toy model uh, we came up with basic energetics of a possible explanation for the Rosita bubbles in which the Fermi bubble represents the emission from shock hot wind material. The edge of the Fermi bubble is just a contact discontinuity. And then the Rosita bubble just represents a shock front that contains the shock ISM. Uh, if you assume this is a realistic model, then you come up with the total energetics of about 10 to the 56 ergs, about 10 times the Fermi bubble. Um, or the equivalent of maybe 10,000 supernovae. And looking at the using some estimate of the Mach number from the temperature of the X-ray gas, uh, we derive uh, an expansion speed and an age, which is of the order of tens of million of years. So you need an energy release rate of a few times 10 to the 41 years per second, but we don't know yet whether this, so it's not, outrageously high. So it could still be possible to invoke a strong uh, outburst from star formation in the nuclear region of the Milky Way to explain it. But energetically, it's probably more comfortable to do that with AGN past uh, outbursts. But the jury is still out with that. So now I'm going back to the old sky map. I'm combining images in, in the three energy ranges. Um, and so you see the full X-ray sky in all its glory. Um, of course, you know, most of the X-ray binaries from the center of the Milky Way are bluish because softer X-ray are absorbed. Um, but you clearly see this uh, greenish yellow Fermi bubble and the red uh, ISM, lower temperature red ISM all throughout. Uh, there are plenty of interesting structure I could point you to. I don't have much time to do that, but just to say that we have large supernova remnants like Vila. I will show you a close up of that. We have famous binaries, Cygnus X1, the first super, uh, stellar mass black hole discovered, Scorpius X1, the brightest neutron star and the brightest X ray source outside of the solar system, the first that Giacconi discovered, plus, of course, Coma, Virgo, and other famous clusters of galaxies, the Magellanic Cloud, large and small, and even distant quasars are all in this image. Um, I think, for in the interest of time, I will skip uh, uh, view and, and, and show you some more beautiful pictures. This is the region around the Vila supernova remnants. The Vila is an old supernova remnant. Uh, it's quite diffuse and large. In, in this particular part of the sky, there are three more supernova remnants. They are not connected physically to each other, they are just in projection. Vila Junior is, all, is, I don't know if you see this almost spherically blue bubble. This is much more energetic, much harder, much more non thermal, if you want, compared to Vila and younger. And Pupi Sei, which is much brighter, it's also more compact and, and nearby. Another interesting discovery we made of a new supernova remnant uh, that was uh, not seen in previous old sky maps, simply because it's quite faint and it's also pretty big. It's four degrees in diameter. So of course, it's very hard to discover with small field of view telescopes. Uh, but we have now in this image, you see the X-ray in pink and um, uh, the radio uh, uh, from Australia at 1.4 gigahertz in blue. And then just to show you the breadth of the science we can do with large catalog of, of millions of X-ray emitters, for example, we have detected about 10% of the planet hosting stars outside of the Kepler field. And of course, in, among those also some interesting peculiar system, for example, this nearby multi-planet system with three Neptunic planets, 
And knowing that the central star is the X-ray emitter is important to understand the ongoing evaporation process of the uh, planetary atmospheres. And so the statistics of this X-ray emitting planet hosting stars is gonna be interesting for planet formation, uh, astrophysics, astronomy. Um, and in my, and that's about everything I wanted to tell you about the old sky survey with one last uh, couple of minutes to uh, tell you something about time domain, okay? Because of the way we do the survey, um, we are sensitive to interesting time domain phenomena. And I wanna show you one or two highlights of that because I think they're quite interesting. Uh, one thing you need to know is that we don't have 24 seven contact with the spacecraft. We only dumped the data from the spacecraft once per day in typically four hour long contact. So we cannot react immediately to any discovery, but typically we do with some delays of a few hours up to 24 hours. And uh, well, I don't want to go into the detail of all the different steps we do with our data, but I just want to remind you what are the typical time scale in place. 50 milliseconds is the time resolution of ECCD, it's the free frame readout time. So we cannot really detect anything faster than 50 milliseconds. 40 seconds is the time it takes for a source to pass over our field of view do, during a scan. Okay, so if there is strong and bright source that varies on short time scale, we can catch that once they are within our field of view. Then, as I said, in four hours, we typically come back to the same part of the sky. So we have uh, typically six to eight data points for each source uh, separated by four hours and then within one day, okay? So within 24 hours, we observe a source for six to eight times, and then we leave it and we come back to it after six months. And so we have these hours and then months time scale you are sensitive to. On the longest time scale, one of the most beautiful image I could show is this animation of a galactic uh, field centered on an X-ray binary that went into outburst before Rosita. What you see here is this expanding ring over six months time scale. And this ring, this beautiful, almost perfect circular ring uh, is due to scattering over dust lane of the light that was produced during the outburst. Um, so it's a dust scattering ring. And the nice thing is that thanks to other multi-wave information, mainly Gaia, we, we can locate the uh, dust lane responsible for most of the scattering. We know the time where the transient went off, so we can use simple geometry to, to derive the distance from the transient. So we can measure the distance from this X-ray binary to one of the best known accuracy, which is important for various estimate of you know, the black hole mass or the uh, Eddington ratio at which the outburst went on. So interesting uh, X-ray binary physics can be done by using this geometrical distance um, of course, you need to be quite lucky, but it's a beautiful example of simple geometry in, in action. And then one last uh, point I want to mention is this quasi-periodic eruption we discovered. Um, this were variability over this four hours time scale. Here you actually see a real light curve of, of one of these events in which uh, each square is a data point taken over every four hour for about 40 seconds of exposure. And here you see that in red, you have data points consistent with the background. And in yellow, you have data points in which the source is very bright. So uh, that's quite unusual uh, for any kind of source, in fact. Typic what, typical what we see over our time scale is uh, coronal flares from flaring stars, but they only go up once, right? So repeating uh, coronal stars is pretty weird. And what makes this source particularly interesting is that this is not a star. The location of the source, uh, first in the Rosita error circle and then uh, uh, improved by XMM Newton follow-up, lies at the, in the nucleus of a galaxy at relatively low redshift. The spectrum of this galaxy is a star forming system with no AGN signature. So it's a normal low mass galaxy that have something in its nucleus that can go uh, up to 10 to the 42 x per second in X-rays and disappear in a matter of hours. We have followed this up. Uh, we have actually discovered two systems like this one operating on very different time scale. The one I showed you before is this one that what you see here is the nicer light curve that we followed up the source for 11 days because the duty cycle was 
very slow. So it, it gives almost one outburst per day. And th then we find another system very similar uh, that has only 2.5 hours semi-periodicity or quasi-periodicity. So over one day, it, it does almost uh, 10 uh, oscillations. Uh, so as I said, these two systems come from very low mass galaxies. So typically you don't expect, so they must have relatively small black hole masses as well. Uh, and what they are, we don't know. Uh, it's, there are only five systems now in the literature. When we publish ours, there were only two known before. Uh, both discovered in the archive of XMM Newton. So uh, we think it's unli unlikely to be classical radiation pressure instability. For those of you that know about uh, accretion flow into black holes, this would be a clear candidate, but both the duty cycle and the shape of this and the ratio of this outburst and the ratio between on and off time, they do not fit with that at least published uh, prediction from radiation pressure instability models. Uh, what we think a possible alternative is some sort of periodic interaction with an orbiting compact object or star. And there are now at least two, if not three, papers in the literature that uh, propose mechanism by which either two or three body mechanism by which you can excite these uh, quasi periodicities. What makes them quite attractive is that they are good candidate for so called extreme migration spiral, so gra gravitational wave uh, emitters. And so we are keep monitoring this to see whether there is period evolution consistent with what gravitational wave emission will predict. But we are really at the beginning, but I, I think this is one example of uh, almost unexpected new field that is opening up uh, by having this large new parameter space discovered by Rosita. And so this leads me to my conclusion probably have taken a few minutes too much, I'm sorry about that. But the main message I want to convey today is that Erosit on SRG is in operation since more than two years with all subsystem working with minimal losses. We have completed uh, almost four all sky surveys and we have a little bit more than four more to go. Uh, thanks to its large grasp uh, and stable background and observing cadence, Erosita is opening up new parameter space for its astronomy really across the different source classes. Our um, performance verification if at survey demonstrate that we have uh, meet, we can meet the requirements to do uh, in the long term uh, uh, cluster cosmology with our system. So we detect them in the uh, expected number and we have to see a way in place to go from the X-ray detection to uh, the anal cosmological analysis, but this of course will take some more time. Uh, and we can look forward to the completed old sky survey at the end of 2023. This will be about factor of 30 deeper than Rosat with a lot of inf additional information in the spectral domain. And there are no other old sky survey X-ray emission of that sensitivity which are planned. So we expect, we hope that our data set will represent a unique legacy unsurpassed for many years. And I will stop here. Thank you very much and take your questions. Thank you for a very nice talk. Do we have questions? I see a raised hand from Tim, first of all. Uh, yeah, I had one question about the uh, Fermi bubbles uh, <laughs> detection or Rosita bubbles. Yes. Um, on I think slide 38, there, loop one is very close and also you know a large object in the sky. And how is the separation done? Yes. Um, it's, it's quite bright. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the million dollar question. In fact, I, I, I alluded that. I don't have a picture. With, I have it somewhere on my computer, but not in my presentation of the overlap between loop one. And you know the debate of the origin of the North Polar Spore, whether local or not, it's decades long, right? And still now you see paper published over the next 10 months, there have been at least two or three different papers published claiming that most of what we see in the North bubble, uh, which is actually quite coincident with the loop one, which is not center on the galactic center is local. And others that say, if you look, for example, at the X-ray absorption along the line of sight in this direction, there seems to be more material than what you could accommodate locally. 
Uh, I think my answer is I don't know. It well, it's well possible that there is an overlap of different structures. In the end, you know, there are plenty of ways in which in a eight of projection you will end up having overlapping structures. For us, really the presence and the symmetry of the southern bubble and the figure of eight symmetry, it's more like, like the, the symmetry is almost impossible to explain otherwise than having at least part, part of what we see here coming from the ergatic center region, at least those distances. But uh, what we are now trying to do, and I may have a slide for that, is to go and take, uh, after we have now improved our energy calibration, go and take spectra of X-rays at different location throughout the Fermi bubbles and studying the, the temperature distribution and the possible amount of NH. And I think the, there is definitely more in the Erosita data than we have published yet. This is just to illustrate the quality. So if you just take from the first old sky survey, and now we have three, right? Um, a region of just about 10 uh, square degree. This is one well within the hot uh, bubble. And this is one outside of it. This is the spectrum that we get. So you clearly see that the hot one, so that the, uh, you know, these are typically oxygen, uh, seven oxygen, eight lines. There's, there are more lines, carbon, and there are um, possible soft uh, multi-temperature component. Of course, you need to be very, very uh, good in modeling your background throughout. Uh, but in general, this is the kind of data we, are, we have in our hands now to try to distinguish also the location of the northern part of the bubbles. I personally do not exclude some uh, over, overlapping, uh, some, some overlapping situation if you want. Thanks. Then we have a question from David. Sure, uh, thanks for a nice uh, talk. So I have uh, a question or two questions about the uh, the image you showed for the coma cluster, this five arc minute uh, image um, and related images really. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the first question is uh, how many of such deep observation of individual clusters um, will you make and will you release in these different data releases? Yeah, yeah, so... Um... In our CalPVs, on the data that we have already released, uh, I think we have three released, three cluster images. Um, the CalPV program was, uh, well, I didn't enter into any of this discussion at all. We, the Erosita data are shared by two consortia. One is German and one is Russian. So for example, the coma PV observation was uh, led by our Russian colleagues. They published the observation, but I don't think they have released the actual data. Well, we, we did release the observation that we took in our part of the performance verification. So I think we, it was actually four. So there is this 3266, and then the next one is uh, this one, 3391.95, plus two more that we are still writing up. These are relatively famous cluster. Our, I mean, these are, called calibration performance verification because are nice images you can do science with, but the main goal of them was to cross calibrate the, the temperature response of Erosita with compared to XMM, Newton and Chandra. So these are very well studied clusters. I don't remember their telephone numbers, um, but that's about it what we took in these three months. Uh, of course, the old sky survey will produce nice images of bright object. Virgo is particularly beautiful, of course. Um, for if you want to have this kind of depth observation, then you will have to wait until the end of the old sky survey. During the pointed phase, I'm sure we will either ourselves in our GTO time, but also the community will have the chance to propose and observe uh, to get more deep, deep wide observation systems. And right now, I think if you go on our EDR page, you should have four. Right. And a, a additional question on the same uh, topic. So in these deep observations, would it be possible uh, to extract uh, spectral information from subregions uh, of um, yes. a nearby cluster? 
Yes, of course, of course. I mean, uh, this one, uh, 3266, I, 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 this is exactly what we did. I mean, I didn't go very clearly through all the steps. I mean, on, uh, this whitish is just the photon counts, right? In, in different color coded by their energy. What Jeremy Sanders did in, in his investigation is to is a very clever algorithm that essentially does a much more sophisticated Voronoite installation. Essentially, he splits this image in equal of equal signal region, small region of equal signal to noise, and he extracts a spectrum from each of the small region. And this is actually what you see here is then from the spectrum you derive temperature, density, and then you can estimate an entropy. And here you see, I don't know, I cannot zoom in, but you know, in the outskirts, the cells are pretty large, but close to the center where you have the peak of the emission, each of this region is very small. And so we have quite a of the, the ICM. This is this entropy. Here you find pressure entropy maps and so on, and even uh, temperature maps. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Ariel. Yes, thank you. Yeah, nice talk. Um, Let's see, I picked up something you said in passing that I, if I understood you correctly, the way you're scanning the sky, uh, you, keep, you keep revisiting the ecliptic poles. Is, is, did I get it right? Correct. Yes, that's correct. So I, I guess my question is, I mean, it sounds like potentially uh, quite exciting uh, feel of you know, parts of the sky where you're revisiting very often. And I, I guess the question I, in my mind is how big is the field of view? And you know, what are your thoughts about what exciting science you can do with this extremely uh, frequent and deep images? Yeah, yeah. So here is an animation that shows essentially this is uh, the region around the South Ecliptic Pole as you over six months. So the central one degree, the field of view is one degree. So the central one degree, we actually observe it every four hours, and it's sorry, one degree is smallish, but not that small. So we have. I would say hundreds of sources for which we can build fantastic light curves. And um, so there is obvious, you know, uh, AGN variability, transient science, stellar flares. I mean, it's, the, the sky is quite dynamic. So for sure there is potential to do that. You know, the, the way we observe strong vignetting. So it takes quite a lot of time to analyze the proper way, uh, but we, we have uh, a couple of people that are focusing only on this small few degree region around the ecliptic poles to study uh, this time domain. Uh, once we get beyond, uh, so time domain is really the most interesting part because in fact already after one and a half whole sky surveys, uh, we get into confusion limit. Our PSF is not very big, so uh, there is not too much to be learned by just keep stacking uh, and stacking. So right now we have, I think, close to 100 kilosecond exposure in this one degree. But if you were to combine all the photo from this 100 kilosecond, you will be confused. But then what we do right now, instead of looking at uh, scan by scan and try to figure out most of the variability uh, properties of the sources. Excellent. And when I, uh... Would you be re reporting those transients you find there? Or, or how would the community find out? Yes, uh, yes. So we are doing it to some extent uh, through ATELS, at least for the, for the brightest transients. I don't think we have found any in this one degree. I mean, it's still, the area is still small and the volume is still small. Uh, on top of that, the South Ecliptic Pole, which is the one, our deep region, is very close to the Magellanic Cloud. So uh, also in terms of stellar contamination and confusion, it's pretty tough to identify the counterparts. But in general, when we do transient searches over the old sky, what we do is we, we have first a manual vetting. So we have internal triggers comparing the new sky with the old sky from the previous survey. We have people on duty every night that gets through the telemetry once they are downloaded to see whether they are bright transient. When we find one of these uh, bright transients of interest, we, we alert the community creators. We are not in the position yet to do something out, automatic or semi-automatic because we are still, the ratio of things that trigger our system to things which I would call interesting 
and here maybe I'm biased, but I would say excluding flaring stars, for example, which are quite common and maybe not that revolutionary, the ratio of this is pretty large. So we don't have yet an, an automatic system that would pick up the few transient, interesting transient um, and alert the community automatically. We may want to, I mean, we, we have been thinking about how to do it, but right now we are not there yet. All right, thank you. So um, we have a final question from Hiranya. Thanks so much for a really interesting talk, beautiful results. Um, I was wondering whether these very detailed observations of uh, clusters like Colma would lead to much better estimates of their masses using X-ray data and what your expectations are on that. Yes, um, well, the, the, uh, I'm not really great expert of, of that, but uh, well, I think the, in, these two examples show that the richness of the X-ray data is probably more having to do with a better understanding the dynamics of the intercluster medium. The issue of mass calibration or of mass measurement, of course, is relevant. Uh, it's a huge, there is a huge debate in the community. And of course, for us, it's particularly important because in order to use cluster to do cosmology, we need to be able to calibrate their masses. And um, but this is typically hard to do with X-ray alone. For example, what we did in IFETS and what we are doing in some of these fields is to compare um, uh, lensing, galaxy, galaxy lensing using very good optical imaging from Subaru, for example. So lensing is a way to get unbiased estimate of the dark matter distribution. While of course, X-rays are only tracing the baryons, so are affected by any non-thermal residual pressure or dynamical effects. And the interplay between these dynamical effects and the true mass is really one of the key questions we would like to answer. So in fact, indeed, we, we try to understand this complex interplay between complex astrophysics. I mean, I, even, I, I haven't even mentioned AGN feedback. So the effect of the central energy source may have on the gas distribution. But in a sense, yes, we will be using our observation to understand those better. We need always some, uh, not always, but we will be wise to use, for example, lensing data or other wavelength information, for example, from Sumeria Zeldovich in order to get the full picture. And, and this is part of the exercise we are doing. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So we will close this colloquium. So thank you very much.